Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to share with you today the lessons that I have learned from 15,000 patients working for a number of decades in the field of weight control. And let me first start with my own failures. For 10 years, I practiced the traditional model of teaching, trying to teach people all foods in moderation, to eat half and leave the other half on the plate. Those who are trained the same think the same. This is one of the most important lessons I've learned from the years that I spent as a professor at Columbia Presbyterian. People are not attracted to the health field because they are risk takers, but rather because they're averse to risk. And that is not an unwise caution, but in the field of weight control, it has produced a 90 to 95% failure rate. And for 10 years, I was part of that failure rate. I noticed again and again that the same people came back to me, gaining back the same weight with the same foods at the same time of the day in the same places again and again and again. And the other observation I made of these people who kept failing is they did not lack willpower. No, some of them were among the very best and the brightest of our society. They did not lack focus. Then how could it be that they were losing to a peanut, a potato chip, or a cookie? And I made a 180 degree turn in my work. And I began to study the 5 to 10 percent who lose weight and keep it off forever. These are our teachers. And the lessons I will share with you today are the lessons of the winners at Weight Control. And after I finish speaking, someone who is far more interesting than myself, my own patient, Jesse Shanker, who is a brilliant chef, and the winner of Iron Chef America contest on television. Jeff will speak of his own life journey. And in presenting his case, it will be very obvious to you that to be successful at weight control has nothing to do with giving up fine food, giving up the world of food, but rather learning how to live amiss the world of food. One of the fundamental errors of the field is that we focus on the nutritional analysis of food. But the most critical variable in focusing on the most obvious variable calories, we have overlooked the most critical, the person. And weight control and its central tenant of all foods in moderation is based on a myth. The statement, all foods in moderation, is a statement of opinion, not of fact. There are no scientific facts to support that statement. In a recent Harvard study, the lead researcher in the field of obesity said, the notion that it is okay to eat everything in moderation is just an excuse to eat whatever you want. And when you look at the studies of the winners, most of them have a small number of foods that they avoid, not because they cannot have them, but because they have learned to make adult decisions that they don't work for them. No, there is no food in the world that we cannot have. The question is, does it work for us or does it sabotage us? And if you are more concerned about the quality of a cookie than the quality of your life, 
then you do not have a weight control problem, but a problem in terms of your philosophy of living. None of us can have it all. It's only in the field of weight control that we have developed the false notion that we can do all things in moderation. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to look out the windows of this building to the larger world. All of human history is a testimony to the fact that human beings are not given to moderation but to excess. No highway planner, no traffic planner has ever made a sign for a highway that said drive moderately. You would have chaos on the road. They put limits and specific limits about how fast to go and sometimes how slow to go. And by guiding ourselves by a false concept of all foods in moderation, we have overlooked the most critical. Let me tell you what they are. One, what is the patient's history? The central principle of health care is ignored in the field of weight control. The same people are gaining back the same weight with the same foods again and again. To tell the average male to eat seven or ten nuts because they're good for the heart is absolutely nuts. Did you ever meet a man who counted seven nuts and stopped? People eat them by the handful. When I was a graduate student at Columbia, they taught us in behavior modification, teach your patients, eat half and leave the other half on the plate. Well, the professor wrote the textbook, so I wasn't about to tell him this sounds like BS, because if you go to a restaurant, people are finishers. This is not how human beings behave. The whole field is obsessed with how we should behave, when in truth, human beings are not given to moderation but to excess. I deal with how human beings really behave in the real world. And I do not suffer from the illusion, as someone trained as a shrink, that you change people. It's easier to change their food choices than to change the human being. And from the day that I started to shift from the prevailing model to a model built on the patient's history and the potato chip commercial, Remember the Frito-Lays or was it Doritos? The potato chip commercial, we bet you cannot have just one. The food industry has understood more about eating behavior than all the experts in my field. There are certain characteristics of food. Let me give you an example. Remember the potato chip commercial, we bet you cannot have just one. If the potato chip was soggy, you could have one. It's the characteristic of salt, of crunch, that stimulates appetite. And treating all foods the same, saying that a calorie is a calorie, ignores the impact of the food on the individual. The new gold standard that should guide each person's life who is concerned about weight is whether this food satisfies you or stimulates overeating. If it stimulates overeating, it doesn't work. If it satisfies you, you don't have to give up great taste. Our chef, Jesse, doesn't give up great taste. His restaurant, Reset, is known for the finest foods. No, it's about avoiding wasted calories, mindless eating. This chip is an example. Another example, the number one food that sabotages diet is, is this food. It's not the great restaurants of the world. It's not the Zagat ratings. The chocolate chip cookie. I once said to Oprah, it's not how many calories in a cookie, but how many you eat based on your history that is the true count of calories. And Oprah said, well, I jog an hour and a half a day. And I said, if you think exercise is going to save you, you better get a road map to Beijing. Your legs will never go as fast as your fingers. The most important exercise in the world 
is the exercise of good judgment at 4 o'clock and the first 10 minutes at dinner, that you don't go into the bread basket, you don't come home and start nibbling whatever's on the counter in your house, or you go to a bar mitzvah or a wedding and start with the hors d'oeuvres because you arrived hungry. Strategy and an understanding of your neurochemistry and of your history is more powerful than willpower. Now, how do I operationalize this? I told you for 10 years I was a failure. When the New York Times did their recent ratings of the leading practices in weight control, we were very honored to be one of the top two practices they cited in the nation for weight control. How do I go about doing this with the human being who sits in front of me? First, I don't spend five minutes talking about calories or carbohydrates. Those who could do all foods in moderation would have no need of the field of weight control. But excuse me for introducing common sense. The second thing I understand, I learned from Homer. In that classic scene from the Odyssey, Odysseus, or as we know, in a more modern version, Ulysses, ties himself to the mast of the ship to resist temptation, to resist the siren song. What is Homer teaching us 3,000 years ago that applies to you tonight in the restaurant when you go to dinner or you go home or when you go shopping in the supermarket because thin starts in the supermarket? Ulysses had a penetrating insight into his own vulnerability. And when he heard the siren song, he didn't behave like the typical dieter and say, let me listen to the first stanza and take a bite. Let me have it this one time. He knew his own sense of vulnerability, and he developed a creative strategy to save himself by tying himself to the mast and putting his fingers in his ears so he would not listen to the siren song. And there is a lesson there that I have guided my patients with, that the essence of our strength is to know our vulnerabilities and to build our lives, not crashing into them, but knowing how to master them. And think about it. The caloric model has led millions of people to failure. Because if you're thinking calorically, what's wrong with one cookie? There is nothing wrong with one cookie. But if you think historically, and you're going to eat the whole package, that is the GPS system to guide you through the world of food. And the best way to misguide yourself is to think of all foods in moderation. I'll tell you who can do all foods in moderation, 5 to 10 percent. That's the success rate in the field guided by all foods in moderation. And I don't think it has anything to do with willpower, but I can tell you as a shrink, it's probably linked to temperament rather than to willpower. And finally, I apply the strategies of the winners in a most creative way. When I was in shrink school at Columbia, I had very little interest in psychology or psychiatry, even though I ended up as a professor of it. I was really interested in how to change health behavior in a way that is sustainable, permanent, and enduring. And I convinced the chair of psychology to let me go to the Graduate School of Business. The most powerful technique to change human behavior is not in the field of weight control, it's not in the field of psychology or psychiatry, but in the field of advertising. How did they get us to part with our favorite possession, money? And when a person buys a Prada outfit, or diesel jeans, or a Mercedes, they feel privileged to spend that money and to wear that label. How do you create the same need to part with your favorite foods that are destroying you and not to feel 
deprived, but to feel liberated. And so I have studied extensively the advertising techniques of the food world. Who would know better how to influence human behavior with eating than the food world? And each week, I make CDs or voice messages for people's iPhones or whatever phone they have, reinforcing the lessons of their history, of strategy, if you're going on a vacation, if you're going to a wedding, the same situations come up again and again. It's not that complicated a world in the world of food. And in guiding my journey, I see the emergence of a field that I have come to advocate today, a field of behavioral nutrition, based not just on the nutritional analysis of food, but the study of how the eater behaves in the presence of that food, looking at the MRIs of the brain, that when certain people eat this cookie, the same center in the brain lights up as for crack if you have the gene for sweetness. Whereas I don't have the gene for salt, so a potato chip would have no relevance for me. And if you look at the field of economics, and Daniel Ariely's work in behavioral economics. He was professor at MIT, now holds the highest chair at Duke, the Duke professorship in psychology and behavioral economics. In studying people's behavior in the field of economics, they get it. Do you know what Ariely said after decades of studying people's behavior? When it comes to important life decisions, human beings are rarely rational in their decision making. So I have exploited the human condition, the techniques of the advertising world to guide my patients and the lessons of the winners. And let me end with the good news. The food has no IQ. It has no life smarts. So if it is winning against us, we are doing something wrong. My job is to figure out what is wrong. And with the aid of my patients' intelligence, willpower, and life smarts to guide them to a new life where they are in control, not a cookie. There is a line in Elton John's Broadway hit, Aida. We are given paradise, but only for a day. In the prime of our lives, it is more important to have the best of health the best of looks, and the best of self-esteem. There's plenty of time when we're old and ancient. I plan to leave this world in a pizza truck. But while the party is great, I think we should be in control, not the food. And that is the mission that I have set for the rest of my life and for each person like Jesse that I am privileged to work with. And I guess that's the theme from Exodus, so thank you.